Well, it's uh, good to be with you uh, on this brisk, cold morning. And before we get into the message, I want to just uh, highlight uh, our vision offering that was taken the, the end of last year, November and December. Um, encouraged many of you who gave above and beyond your normal giving. And uh, I'm here to report that uh, our church was able to give away $167,000 to a bunch of various ministries. One of them is uh, our ministry partners in India. And if you've been paying attention to what's been happening in India, it is the 10th most difficult country to be a Christian in. And we support uh, an organization, a small denomination that's before COVID was starting three to five new churches every year. They train pastors, they start churches. Um, if in the news, just uh, in the last couple weeks, they announced that Mother Teresa's organization was going to be shut down. Um, the international backlash of that was so strong that they backed off and said, okay, we'll still allow you to continue to accept foreign funds and to operate, but things are difficult there. And so I'm just so thankful that we're able to give over $100,000 to help that ministry through this end of the year offering. In addition to that, we gave $10,000 uh, more than we normally give to Hope for Cora, Jake Boner's organization in, in uh, the slum Cora outside of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And uh, in addition to that, we we're able to give to the two crisis pregnancies that our church supports, the one in New York, Life Choices. We we're able to give them uh, ten, and, and then also to um, uh, CareNet in Northeast Pennsylvania. They're starting a new uh, CareNet site in Forest City. And so tens of thousands of dollars were able to be given to both of those organizations as well. And so that is because, number one, of your generosity. And so not all of that actually was out of the special vision designated funds. Some of that was out of the general, what I call the boring general fund um, that pays for electricity and salaries and all of that stuff. And the reason we were able to do that is also because we paid off all of our debt last January. And so able to do that. And that is something to praise the Lord about. Um, here's, here's another snapshot, and I think this is important. Fifteen years ago, the total income of Bridgewater was about $211,000. That was all of our income to pay for everything. And even adjusted for inflation, which is a real thing, um, that'd be about $290,000 today. Even adjusted for inflation, last year we gave away more money than our total income 15 years ago. And the way that happens is because 15 years ago, we averaged 250 people on a Sunday morning. And now, with five different campuses and online, we average over 1,250 people on a Sunday morning. So when you have spiritual conversations with family members and neighbors and friends and coworkers and classmates, not only is that good for our community, but that is good for the world. Because it allows, you know, the, the, the church to, to gather people and to do more because, because the church is healthier and because the church is reaching more people. And so I just want to encourage you. There are invitation cards like on that little round table on your way out or at the Welcome Center to invite people. If, if this church, if, if you believe uh, that our mission as Christians is to make more and better disciples and if you believe this church is, is helping to accomplish that, then not only should you be a part of that, but you need to invite as many people as possible to join you in that journey in doing that as well. So that's a totally different subject, but I just wanted to really uh, celebrate that and what God has been doing here and even through this whole pandemic. So we're all freaking out, and why we don't need to, we're going to talk about depression today. One in 36 people are severely depressed. This means it... it, it change it it um, hampers people's ability to communicate to sleep to even function one in 36 but one in five have mild symptoms of depression or at least at, at one point in the last two years or perhaps even now or two weeks excuse me mild depression one in five here's the thing about these statistics um, they have doubled in the last 10 years and this is before COVID. Okay, so, so people don't know how depressed people are since COVID, but they think it's higher. 
They just, they just can't measure, they haven't been able to measure it yet. I haven't seen statistics, but, but this is what was going on before COVID. Depression on the rise. We are uh, among the most medicated societies in human history. What, what is going on? And so I want to talk this morning about depression. And the first thing I want to say is that depression is real. One of the least helpful things you can tell someone who's depressed is it's all in your head. Okay, you know what else is all in your head? If I were to put my hand over a burning flame and my skin would melt, the pain would all be in my head, right? That's why an epidural works, right? That, because, because pain is in our head, and the truth is emotional pain is just as real and often worse than physical pain. If you were to ask a depressed person, would you, would you rather have the pain of a broken arm or, or this depression pain? And they would... Every time, they would say, break my arm. If, if that could take away, I would prefer that. And so, it, it, is, it is real. Um, another thing we need to recognize about depression is depression itself is not sinful. Okay, it's, it's like nausea. If I would, came up, and I'm not nauseous, but if I, if I were to say, man, I am so nauseous, none of you would think, well, that's sin. Now, if I had just drunk six beers and I came up and said I was nauseous, it might be the result of sin or it might not. But the feeling of nausea itself, just like the feeling of depression itself, is not in itself sinful. Uh, another thing that we're going to talk about in a little bit more depth is that depression does have a cause. Sometimes we talk about it so much of like it's an illness and we may have the impression that it's this totally random thing with, with no real cause from it, and it's totally out of control, but, but it, it does have a cause. And so I'm going to talk about some of the causes of depression, and, and I'm going to hit on, I think, four or five. The, this is not an exhaustive list, okay? There, there are more things beyond this, just hitting some of the main causes of depression. Uh, number one cause is, is physical, especially if you're depressed and you don't seem to have a reason for it. Okay, your, your, your job is great, your, your family's great, everything's going well, and you're just really depressed. That may be a physical reason for it. And, and there are a lot, of, um, a lot of potential physical reasons. Obviously, if you just had a baby and you're getting four hours of sleep a night, hmm, what may be causing your depression? Uh, you know, postpartum depression is a real thing. Uh, thyroid issues, uh, brain cancer, like if you had a head trauma, I mean, there, there's a lot of physical. So, so if you're depressed, it, it isn't a bad thing to go see a doctor. That, that could be very helpful because there may be physical things that are causing this. Um, worry and anxiety can cause depression. Um, the verse there out of Proverbs says this, anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers them up. If you are anxious and fearful long enough, you will become depressed, right? There's a, a woman in our congregation, and she told her son, I'm incredibly depressed and, and, and just overwhelmed. And his response was, of course you are, Mom. So what do you mean? You listen, you have the news on, and you listen to a hundred terrible stories for hours every day. Of course it's going to make you depressed, Right? So if you're anxious and fearful for long enough, a lot of times that, that f brings you to a cliff and it falls over into despair and depression. This is true about anger and some other things as well. Anger turned inward. You're mad at yourself. You're, Man, you're so stupid. Why do you do that? I hate, I hate how I am. I hate who I am. I hate what I look like. I hate... Well, that anger, self-directed, can also spill over into depression. Um, spiritual issues... Psalm 32. Now, this isn't all depression caused by spiritual issues or sin, but, but some is. Psalm 32, David says, When I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. When I was in college, I wrote Becky a couple really depressing letters. And when she got them, it, 
she just didn't understand them. She's like, Bob sounds suicidal. He sounds depressed. This isn't the Bob I know. What is he, what is behind this? What is going on? And I was addicted and I was in sin that, that I was doing over and over and, and, and tied to and it just ate me up and depressed me, and I, I, I hid it, and I didn't want anyone to know, um, but, but sin and spiritual issues can cause depression, including um, self-focus. Um, Philippians 2, 3 through 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Sometimes a self-focus isn't the initial cause of depression, although it may be, but it is something that keeps you in depression. Because if you're constantly thinking about yourself, you're constantly spending time with someone who's depressed, right? And that's not, that's not helpful. And, and so, you know, to think outside of this, back in the early October, we did Don't Go to Church, Be the Church Sunday. And so instead of, for those of you who weren't here for that, um, instead of coming to church and hearing about how we should love God and love people, we came to church and we immediately turned around and left. No sermon, no music to, to love God through loving people in our community. We did over 30 different projects in, in the Montrose area. And so there was a, a girl, a teenage girl, who she got out of a, a mental hospital on Saturday. She'd been suicidal, she'd, she'd you know, threatening self-harm, and probably, I think, I, I don't know all the, what, what went on, but she got out of the mental institution on Saturday. Sunday was Don't Go to Church Sunday. She was involved in serving other people. She came up to me the next week, and she said, Pastor Bob, uh, I was in the hospital, and then I went and did this stuff for these other people. Do you know serving people made me happy? And I said, yes, that is exactly right. In fact, some adults haven't put this together, but one of the most fulfilling, Jesus said, is more blessed to give than to receive. One of the most joy-filling things is to get yourself off of your problems and help somebody else with their problems and to serve others because we're taking that focus off of ourselves. We were not designed by God to focus on ourselves. We were designed by God to focus on Him and to focus on others. And when we do that, it, it helps us overcome depression. And when we don't, and when you're th if your thoughts are constantly on yourself, whether it's on how bad you are or, or how great you are and nobody else seems to see it and appreciate it, that will probably bring you to depression eventually. And so um, don't focus on yourselves. And then circumstances. Uh, you know... It's talking about spiritual issues and causes of depression. Some of the most godly people in the Bible suffered from depression. Elijah was suicidal. He went out into a desert with no food, no water, laid down and said, God, kill me, all by himself. If God hadn't supernaturally aided him with an angel bringing food, and he, he might not have made it. But he was so depressed. And yet a godly man, a great prophet, and on and on through the Bible, Naomi and, and David and, and Job. And Job was depressed because he had a very wealthy man and then some raiders came, took away many of his herds and, and, and wealth and then a tornado came and knocked down a building, one of his buildings and killed all his children. And then he got sick with boils and he had broken pottery and he's scraping the pus off of his body, you know, sitting in ashes and... I mean, if Job wasn't depressed, he wouldn't have been human, right? And if you have, we've, we've had a number of losses in our church family recently. Joanne Heitzman lost her father, John, and uh, the Bixby's. Uh, Pastor Brett Bixby lost his mom to cancer just this week. And, you know, your husband's in the hospital and you had a house fire within the last year. I mean, there's, there's circumstances, that, and, and that, rightly so, can cause depression, and don't think of yourself as broken. Think of yourself as human. You know, if you, some people, you know, if they weren't sad, there'd probably be something wrong. And here's what Job says, And now my life ebbs away. Days of suffering grip me. Night pierces my bones. My gnawing pains never rest. In his great power, God becomes like clothing to me. This is clothing in a bad way, like a straitjacket. 
He binds me like the neck of my garment. He throws me out into the mud and I'm reduced to dust and ashes. I cry out to you, God, but you don't answer. I stand up, but you merely look at me. And, and this brings out a truth that is very important, and that is no matter what causes your depression, it will create a spiritual crisis. And this is true even physically. If you get cancer, that will create a, a spiritual crisis. If you have a child who's, who's running from God and maybe hates you or whatever, that will create. We are not like, as men, we like to put everything in little boxes, you know, and separate them. Human beings, that, that's not how we're made. We are one person. And so the emotional and the relational and the physical, it bleeds over into the spiritual. And so Job here is having a spiritual crisis because his kids are dead. He's lost all his wealth. His health is broken. And, and depression, whatever causes it, it does create a spiritual crisis because you wonder, where is God in all of this? So, so how do you fight depression? And I'm going to list a number of ways to fight depression. And I would say, if you are depressed right now, don't just pick one. Man, fire at this thing with every weapon you, you have. All right, and, and just be, because it is a monster, but it's not bigger than Jesus. And so, number one, how do you fight depression? You fight it physically. This is uh, maybe should be some of your life verses. In vain you rise early and stay up late toiling for food to eat, for God grants sleep to those he loves. <laughs> and some of you who are depressed, you're like, yep, and God doesn't love me because I can't sleep at night. No, that's not what it's saying. Okay, I'm just saying sleep is good. And, and if you struggle with depression, you need to go to bed the same time every day. And you need to get up the same time and, and try to get some sleep. And if you have a small child, that's impossible. But, you know, maybe sleep when they sleep. But sleep is important. I, I listed a bunch of other things, and I found them actually all in this article, how to increase serotonin in the human brain without drugs. Serotonin is some kind of positive chemical that our brain releases. How do you, how do you get that? Well, number one, they said grateful, positive thoughts. Think grateful, positive thoughts. Back in November, challenged everyone about gratitude. Write even either in a gratitude journal once a week. Spend 15, 20 minutes just writing what you're thankful for about God, about life, about your circumstances, or write a grateful letter to someone. And that way they'll benefit and then you benefit. Grateful, positive thoughts, really powerful. Number two in that article, it said get natural light. Um, the youth pastor here at the church, Don Fenner, uh, 14, 15 years ago, every February, early February, late January, he would get depressed. And uh, by the time he was in his early to mid-20s, he'd figured it out. It, it's light. And so he had this special lamp that he would shine on himself, uh, you know, starting like in December especially. And, and, and so just that, that may be a factor. Uh, again, it... It depends on what causes your depression. So it's, depression isn't a one-size-fits-all thing, right? If I went, it's like if I went to a doctor and I said, doctor, my stomach hurts. Okay, what would he do? Well, he's not going to do anything yet. He's going to ask questions because that could be because I drank s sour milk last night. It could be because I have Crohn's disease. It could be because I have a tumor. It could be I, have a, I might have a hernia. Maybe, maybe it's because my wife just sucker punched me. You know, I, you know that never happens. I'm always ready for it. No. no, I mean, you know, my stomach hurts. That, that could mean anything. You could have cancer. You could, I mean, what, colon, what, what? if you're depressed, I mean, that could be caused by by tons of things. And so identifying the, the thing or things that are causing your depression is really important in, in treating it. And so physically, other things this article mentioned is exercise. You know, and if you're depressed, that's the last thing you want to do. I mean, you can hardly get out of bed. Uh, but but it, a lot of times the medicine we need is not what we want. Exercise, a, a healthy diet. And I don't know what a healthy diet is. There are certain foods they said that were better, but in general, you know, junk is bad. 
<laughs> and the good stuff is good for you. And, and so all of these different things physically um, can help you battle against depression. And um, another, another way to battle against depression is mentally. 2 Corinthians 10.5, and we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Nobody talks to you more than you. And what are you telling yourself? Day in and day out, you're so stupid. You know, life is terrible. Things are going to get worse. What, you know, and, and so just every thought, like, is, is, is it a weapon of the enemy? Or is it a weapon of God? And you say, well, well I don't want to think, you know, I don't want to think on positive things. It, it's, it, it is. It's, it's like hard to do what Philippians 4.8 is saying. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, our minds naturally go toward problems, go toward the negative, right? If, if there's something hurting in your body, if you got a headache, you're not thinking, you know what? My knee is feeling pretty good, actually. No, you're concentrating on your head. But this is saying, God is saying, you know, you need to think about lovely, admirable. If anything is praiseworthy, think about these things. And then even beyond that, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Do the right things that you know you should do, even if you don't feel like it. And, and this, there's a mental battle in, in depression many times that, that, yeah, medicine might help, but if you're, if you're depressed because you're anxious, you need to stop dwelling on these fearful, worrisome thoughts. Um, another way to fight depression is relationally, and I think more than any of these other factors, I think your relationships will determine whether you make it out or not. And again, in depression, we pull away from people. I don't want to be with people. I'm miserable. But, but what we need to do is we need to lean into people and, and, um, and those relationships. Here's another psalm, a proverb I mentioned before. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. Um, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. There are some burdens that were never meant to be carried alone. On purpose, designed by God, some things are too heavy for any one person to deal with or handle. And he designed it that way because he designed us to need him and to need each other and, and to help others. So if you're here this morning and you're not depressed, who, who do you know that you maybe haven't spoken to in a while? Who, who should you reach out to? Maybe someone who's still um, isolating um, uh, during, from, from COVID, maybe someone who's, who's, who's down. or it, it, it Reach out to others because we need to, as, as believers, God commands us to bear one another's burdens. And so, you know, we need to help relationally. In fact, this is why I'm wearing the small group shirt, right? This is why we have small groups, is, is to help facilitate that. And so if you're online, I think Pastor Andrew will probably put some little pop-up thing that you can click on if you're interested in small groups in the chat. Or, or if you're here after the service, there's a table in the back with a bunch of different sign-ups. And, and actually, who, who here is in a small group? Raise your hand if you're in a small group. Wow, half of our church is in a small group, but most of you came this service. So if you raised your hand, raise it up a little bit. Look at somebody who doesn't have their hand raised and invite them to your group, all right? Okay, they're going to feel really bad now <laughs> if you don't invite them, all right? But um, relationally, this, this is an important aspect. And then patiently, um, this is God's word to, to Paul. He, God, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul had this problem that was incredibly debilitating to him, and he said, I begged God three times to take it away from me, and this was my response, no, you need to just persevere in the middle of it and through it. And, and so whatever that was, this, this same guy, Paul, who begged God to make life easy for, easier for him, and God said no, he says this, we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him. 
He's not saying this out of some ivory tower. Theoretically, God brings bad things, you know, and brings good out of them. No, Paul is saying, I have been whipped and beaten and betrayed and shipwrecked and, and starving, and I know that God works all things for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. And goes on to say, I, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He's, he's saying it will be worth it all. We just need to be patient. We just need to keep going. And, and I do want to say, never, never come up with a permanent solution for a temporary emotion. And that's suicide. A permanent solution to a temporary emotion. And especially if, you young, if you're young, you don't realize how long life is and how much it changes. And, and so reach out to others, but realize, I just need to persevere and, and do that. And then finally, fight depression spiritually. Honestly, all of these things are spiritual. Get, getting good sleep is spiritual. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Your, your diet, what you eat is spiritual. What you drink is spiritual. So all of this is spiritual, but I guess what I want to especially emphasize with this spiritually idea is just to fix your eyes and you put your focus on Jesus because the church might get it wrong. And I may not understand your depression, and I may respond poorly or wrongly to you, or maybe a friend doesn't get it and maybe says something unhelpful or that makes it even worse, but Jesus understands, and God understands. Here's what it says about him in Isaiah. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Jesus is familiar with your pain. Hebrews goes on to say, we don't have a high priest. He's talking about Jesus who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who's been tempted in any way, just as we are, yet without sin. You say, well, so was Jesus ever depressed? In the garden, he sweat drops of blood, not because he was happy. (laughs) Of course, he's, he's, he's gone through depression. He's, he's, he's experienced the whole range and to the extremes, the range of human emotion because he became human. And he understands. Jesus' first sermon that we have recorded, he came into the synagogue, the scroll of Isaiah was there, He opened it. It was on this spot. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Jesus rolled up the scroll, essentially kind of dropped the mic and said, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. I am the answer to this. I will bind up the brokenhearted. I will proclaim freedom to the captives and release from darkness. And then Psalm 34, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. If you're, if you're depressed today, if you're brokenhearted, you probably feel like God's farther away. And that may be how you feel, but that's not what's true. And, and God isn't like, oh, come on, I've done so much for you and you're depressed, get over it. No, no, He draws close to the brokenhearted and those who are crushed in spirit. I just want to close with a story that was really powerful to me. It's written, it was given by Louis Giglio. If if, um, we have these uh, books that we're selling in the uh, kids' ministry area, and he he wrote one of these indescribable 100 devotions about God and science. If you have a kid in fifth grade or down, I just encourage you to get this and go through it with them one one day at a time. but he wrote this, he's a pastor. He talked about a time in his life where he was just suffering from debilitating uh, depression. And he had all sorts of physical problems as well, sharp pain in his arm. He went to see doctors, numbness and lack of feeling in his legs at times, and just all these mysterious illnesses. And, and every morning, 2 a.m., he would wake up 
wide awake and would sob and just so overwhelmed with a cloud of depression. Didn't matter when he went to bed. In fact, he, he, he often feared going to bed and, and just, just would, would be so depressed from 2 a.m. And then he would, you know, almost not off to sleep and his alarm would go off at 6 and he'd have to go through the day. And just so much trouble, trying to function, so difficult, night after night. And finally, one night, he just said, God, I just can't do it. I cannot take one more night. It's 2 a.m. again, and I know what's coming, and I know I won't be able to sleep, and I'm totally exhausted, and God, I just can't do this. And God brought to his mind a verse, and he didn't share what that verse was, but this is why it's so important, I think, for us to memorize God's word so God can, can give us those words when we need it most. He thought of a verse, and the other thing he thought of was a song. And, and he could only think of four lines in the entire song, but it was, be still my soul. And he just began to recite in his head those four lines and then say them out loud and then sing them. And he said, uh, the darkness didn't get any dimmer uh, or brighter. And he went to six o'clock and the alarm went off and he went through another exhausting day and he said, the next night, it was just as bad. Nothing changed. He says, except that I felt like I had a plan and a strategy. And so 2 a.m. hit and immediately recite that verse and then over and over and over again. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on my side. Bear patiently the cross of grief for shame. Leave to thy God to order and provide. In every change, he faithful will remain. Over and over, be still my soul. And just, and he said it didn't, change anything. He felt just as bad. Night two, three, four, five. But then he said the sixth night, he woke up at 2 a.m. and he started singing. And he said, and it just seemed like the clouds began to recede. And little by little, week after week, singing that song thousands of times, and not even the whole song, just the four lines that he could remember. It helped him overcome and get beyond it, and things got brighter, and things got better. Patiently, spiritually fighting it, physically doing whatever he could do, relationally, he had people in his life who was praying for him and all of that, I just want to encourage you, if you're struggling with depression now, you need a song. Find your song. It might not be that song. You might be totally unfamiliar with it. It might be another song. It might be another in the fire. We're going to close with a song. I'm going to see a victory. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. The battle belongs to the Lord. And to recite over and over and to, to sing it out. And if you're married, you might wake up your spouse, but if you're that depressed, they'll be happy for you. <laughs> you know, and just over and over again, I think sometimes we underestimate, I know I underestimate the power, that God, how God can use music. Maybe, maybe the application to this is maybe you just need to listen to Christian radio for a month. Listen to nothing else but Christian radio. I had a friend in a very difficult work situation. He said, I like to listen to my rock music on the way in. And he said, and I would just, just struggle during the day and I'd blow up and I'd be so discouraged and depressed and angry. And he said, and I started listening to God's word. I started listening to Christian radio, put my mind in a totally different place and made work go. It was the same work, but I was a different guy in that work. So find a song. There's a way out. Depression is real. It's a monster. 
but it's not bigger than Jesus. Heavenly Father, I just, I just ask that if there are people online, people here in the auditorium this morning who are struggling with depression, God, that they would reach out to others. God, that they would just fight it physically, but God, that you would give them a song as well. Lord, that you would give us a verse, that, that you would give us the tools that we need to overcome it and give us patience and perseverance in that fight as well. Lord, I just, I just thank you that, that we know, no matter how bad it gets, that you understand. You know. You know what we're going through. You know what it's like. And, and you're not far away. You're close to the brokenhearted. God, just uh, help us this morning to just run to you and follow you. And Lord, for those of us who are, our lives are going great and we're in a, in, a, in a good place, Lord, help us bring to our mind names, faces of those who maybe aren't doing so well and to, to reach out to them, to encourage them. A kind word cheers people up. Help us to be a kind word to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.